Well, hello, everyone. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Welcome to Backstage, our big event on uh, online MBA programs. Uh, obviously, there is an explosion of them. They're very popular because they offer students tremendous flexibility to retain your job and your income while getting an MBA degree. Uh, in many cases, you can stretch that degree out uh, for uh, up to four or five years in, in some programs or complete the degree in as little as uh, basically two years or less. So <clears throat> it's sort of an ideal alternative for those who don't want to quit their jobs and go back to school full time or maybe you know, are further along in their careers. And the choice might be, you know, do I do an online MBA or a more traditional executive MBA program? Today, to explore the topic of what an online MBA experience would be like and how one program will differ from another, we have four terrific opportunities for you to explore. Uh, at UNC Kidd and Flagler Business School, we have Matt Henty, the director of MBA at UNC which is a program uh, that's been around for a good number of years. And uh, UNC was a pioneer with uh, the online education company 2U in launching uh, mm -hmm. their program. We have uh, the Jack Welch Management Institute, represented by Mary Carr, the senior provost and dean. Uh, as many of you may know, I collaborated with Jack on his best-selling book, Straight from the Gut, many years ago, uh, from Michigan Ross. We have Patty Russo, the managing director of their online MBA, which is a relatively new program. And uh, from what I recall, I think, you know, it's it's one of the pioneer programs in terms of a uh, uh, highly ranked uh, MBA school getting into the online game. And then we have Georgetown McGonough uh, and we have Prashant Malavia the senior associate dean for MBA programs. Welcome all. <laughs> So let's, let's get down to the basics. Um, I want to have each person just talk a little bit about uh, the school that they're at in general, uh, and then specifically a little bit about the online MBA program. When was it started? How long does it take to complete it? Um, and let's start with you, Matt, at UNC. Sure. Thank you, John. appreciate you uh, having me on today. Um, so the uh, history of the Keenan Flagler Business School actually goes way back. Uh, so we are named after a couple of uh, very prosperous uh, and, and uh, people who have uh, done great things for the uh, DUS. Uh, many people may not know Henry Flagler, but he was actually one half of, of Standard Oil. Um, he amassed a, a wealth and fortune um, through Standard Oil and actually retired down to Florida. Uh, eventually he married uh, a woman named Mary Lily uh, Keenan and they got together. And uh, after uh, Henry's death, uh, he left his fortune to Mary. Mary's family actually had strong ties to North Carolina. And then um, when she passed, she left all of her fortune to her, her brother and her sisters. And those strong ties have continued on through the years. Um, and the Keenan family has been very good to University of North Carolina donating to a number of uh, charitable causes. Uh, and then in 1991, uh, the Keenan Flagler Business School was renamed to Keenan Flagler Business School uh, in recognition of all the substantial guests from the, the Keenan Charitable Trust. Um, and then our program has been around for the last 11 years. Uh, so we've been um, doing online education for a, a fairly long time, um, been um, hopefully pretty successful at it, um, and very happy to uh, work with students to get their MBA through those uh, last 11 years. And how long does it take to complete your program, Matt? Yeah, our program um, is flexible. It's, it's quite nice to, to come into the program. Uh, students can complete their MBA in as little as 18 months or as many as 36 months. Uh, on average, students typically take about 24 months to complete their MBA, um, but we have that flexibility built in so that they can speed up or slow down. Um, we know that students are, are busy working professionals, and so sometimes personal things come up, professional things come up, uh, so we provide a little bit of flexibility there. Great. Uh, Patty, give us the lowdown at Michigan Ross. <laughs> Thanks, John. Hi, everybody. Um, yes. So um, from what I understand, uh, in two years, the College of Business at the University of Michigan will be celebrating its 100th anniversary. 
Um, and uh, um, I've been working at the institution for about 10 years. And uh, as far as the online program goes, we started in, uh, we seated our first class in fall of 2019. So as you said before, we are a relatively new program. Um, we are, of course, um, a ranked top MBA in both part-time, the executive, and the full-time programs due to the wonderful quality of our faculty, and um, we are, in general, a general management degree. Um, as I said, we seated our first class in fall of 2019. Uh, like Matt, it is a flexible program. So like Matt's programs, uh, program, it is a flexible program. We, you could take anywhere between, I'd say, two and a half years to um, actually up to 10 years to get your degree. Though that is a, that's a University of Michigan rule. I would not recommend anyone take 10 years, but Definitely you not. can. <laughs> um, the average uh, student um, so far has probably taken about three to three and a half years to get the, to, to get the degree. Yep. Uh, and I remember doing a story on your very first graduate. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a woman yes. who completed the program very quickly on an accelerated pace. She just flew through it. Yes. Uh, Lindsay Case is a force of nature. I believe we all have students who are like that. <laughs> Indeed. And Prashant, you're really the new kid on the block uh, in the online uh, arena. Am I, am I right? Uh, yes, absolutely. We are yet to launch. Uh, we yes. will launch uh, this coming fall on uh, August of 2023, uh, and and are uh, ex you know very excited to be working with our faculty, with our uh, staff, uh, to get the first group of students into the classroom to develop uh, the online course content uh, that is happening as of now. Um, so yeah, we we are going to start uh, hopefully. Um, uh, you know, with, with a bang uh, in August of 23. The McDonough School itself is, uh, uh, will be 65, is 65 years old. Uh, the MBA program is uh, exactly 42 years old. Um, and um, we've had a, a full-time MBA program of 42 years, a part-time MBA program since 2005, and now an online uh, Flex MBA from 2023. Uh, I think all of our MBA programs, including our, our fourth MBA program, which is the executive MBA, all have, uh, they share um, a focus on bringing in uh, the resources that we can access in Washington, D.C., uh, and helping students understand um, the forces that often are not in their control that influence business like politics, like regulation, policy, diplomacy, and and how does uh, how do all of those forces shape business? So in many ways, that's sort of you know what uh, stands out for uh, the experience uh, for our students in their uh, MBA program. Terrific, and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of excitement uh, about the launch and preparing faculty to uh, refresh their courses and do them completely online. Um, I think that's sort of a rejuvenating experience for a faculty member, frankly. And what, what has been exciting them quite a bit actually is, uh, you know, many of them uh, travel and our flex uh, online advertising is all over uh, the airport. So, so they take uh -huh. pictures with them in, in, in it and send it to our admissions team who are very excited to see that at least some people are noticing our advertising. Uh, That's great. That's fantastic. It's always good to walk through an airport and see, oh my goodness, yes, I work there. <laughs> And Mary, uh, you you represent the Jack Welch Management Institute. Of course, uh, it is a school that was uh, not only named after and founded by uh, the legendary chairman of General Electric, Jack Welch, but but one that very much adheres to his thoughts about leadership, uh, strategy, uh, and how a company should operate. Right. Absolutely. And uh, I miss Jack every day. It's, it's been about two years now, and I had the the privilege to work with him on building the curriculum and content here at JWMI and, uh, you know, and bring his vision of transforming working professionals into leaders to life, right? And uh, so it's been a, it's been a joy to see it come to fruition. The program itself is about 11 years old, but we're 
We live inside an institution known as Strayer University, which is over 130 years old, and uh, and have had you know several benefits from that partnership, of course. And um, for our students, it's very similar to what other folks have shared today. They can take one class at a time or two classes at a time. If they do two, it's 18 months. Um, and on if they do one, it's about three years. And on average, though, most go two and a half. So they might start with one, see how it feels, build their confidence. And by the end, they're saying, hey, Mary, I want to take two classes and, and finish as soon as, as possible, especially when they start to see the benefits of how they're applying what they learn in the workplace. And um, so, yeah, it's been a, it's been an incredible opportunity. And we do all that we can to keep Jack's canon and principles, which we, you know, we feel are timeless throughout the curriculum here. Now, I know Jack was almost obsessive when it came to uh, reading customer satisfaction or yeah. student satisfaction scores. Who who looks at those with the kind of scrutiny that you, <laughs> well, you do? Okay. I do. I do. Yeah. So, you know, uh, every term we read through a couple of different things. One of the things that makes us different here is we really take student feedback to heart. So we read through course evaluations. It's how we... Uh, measure and manage the performance of our faculty. So faculty members get every term their feedback on what's working and what's not working. We also, I, I work with our curriculum team here to say, okay, if a lot of students are saying this material is outdated or this book is crazy, we might go in and change uh, the book and we'll go in and take another look at that class. And so we read through what's also called um, the voice of the student survey. It's net promoter score. Uh, to try to, you know, and right now, knock on wood, we're sitting above 80 at a net promoter score for our students. And that's because we have to read it and and do something about it, right? Just as Jack taught us. So he he prepared us well, and uh, he did challenge myself and some of the other deans and the leadership team here to make sure we're constantly making that a part of our process. So we do that every single quarter and still carry on that tradition. And, and honestly, it it definitely makes us smarter and hopefully improves the student experience. Right. Now, I want to use two terms that uh, some people may be familiar with, at least if you're in the industry, you know, of course. Uh, but if you're not, uh, you won't and you should learn these two terms uh, if you want to avail yourself of online education. And the two words are asynchronous and synchronous. And so I'm wondering in each of your programs, uh, how you balance those two things. Uh, one being uh, live classes delivered on the internet or in person, in some cases when you have weekend or other kinds of immersions. Uh, and the other being uh, work that you basically do online uh, without a faculty member present uh, in a live capacity. So tell me what percentage is asynchronous and what's synchronous. Uh, and also give me a sense of how much the core curriculum takes, the required courses, and how much flexibility people have to take elective courses, and whether or not you have uh, concentrations, uh, specializations, or majors, or whatever you call them. We all know what they are. They're a deep dive in a, in a singular subject. Uh, Matt, let's start with you. Asynchronous, synchronous, uh, electives versus core, uh, concentrations or not. Sure. Well, maybe at UNC believes strongly in making those connections across the class. So with our program, students come into the class and it's kind of a flipped classroom model. So students will prepare some content ahead of time. There are synchronous videos that they have to watch, uh, case studies that they have to read, um, and material that the instructor preps ahead of time that the students need to prepare for class. Uh, so the students do that every week and then they are also in class. So live synchronous sessions with their instructor um, and their classmates every week. So they're making those connections. They are getting real-time feedback on their uh, homework and their course submissions. They're asking questions of their instructor and their classmates. Uh, and so they're balancing those two things, uh, you know, every week going through the, the program there. Um, and we believe that's kind of a, a really nice way to make sure the students are learning the material, um, getting the questions answered that they need to get answered. Uh, and really connecting with their peers in the program, because that's one of the strong points of our program is we have great students in the program who have a wealth of experience that they bring to the discussions in the, in the class. Um, so the, you know, the, the async and the synchronous sessions really balance each other out. 
Um, as students go through the program, uh, they can pick from one of six concentrations in our program. Um, we have uh, a couple different options, data analytics and decision making, entrepreneurship, uh, finance, management and leadership, marketing, uh, strategy and consulting. Uh, so they can pick one of those as they kind of go through the program and we um, take the courses that lead up to that concentration. And you, John, you said it you know, correctly, it's just a, a deeper dive into that content area that the students really enjoy and that they can use to you know, balance out their curriculum um, or you know, apply those skills to their, their current job or what may be for a job they may be looking towards in the future. Um, so there's definitely a, a lot of opportunity there as far as, as concentrations and curriculum balance. Um, as far as our curriculum goes though, uh, students in the MBA at UNC program go through a core set of courses. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that you can take up to, you know, up to 36 months, but you can also complete the program in as little as 18 months. Um, on average, students complete in about 24 months. So usually that first year is taking those core, core, core courses. And that's foundational material that we believe will set the students up for success and really give them an opportunity to um, build off of the second part of the curriculum, which is elective opportunities in the program. And those elective opportunities are just a, a great way for students to customize their curriculum, uh, whether they're looking to switch industries and they want to learn new material, um, or if they're looking to round out their skills in their current industry. Um, the second half of the curriculum is completely customizable, so students can select the electives that they want. Uh, and then we also have opportunities for our students to take um, what we call cross MBA courses, which is elective courses in our full time MBA program, our evening MBA program and our weekend MBA program. So just a, a wealth of opportunities there for students as they go through the program. Great. Patricia, what, what's that look like at Michigan Ross in terms of async, sync, uh, core electives and concentrations? Sure. Well, again, um, uh, like Matt's program, we are a combination of, um, of uh, asynchronous and synchronous learning. So um, our courses are, in general, I'd say about 70% asynchronous. Um, our courses have been specially designed by our um, senior faculty members with degreed learning designers to sort of translate their material into a, a learning environment that is still engaging, even though it is you and the computer at home alone. Um, so that's the first thing. But then uh, uh, in, in, in every course, uh, students also gather with faculty and with fellow students in real time to do case discussions or um, answer questions, you know, play, play simulations and things like that. We also do require students um, to, com to complete three residencies uh, by the time they leave uh, Ross. So um, they can come to campus and we are going to be having welcoming some students in a couple of weeks, the week after Thanksgiving, they will be coming to campus. They can also do an international residency. We mm -hmm. offer at least one a year. Last year it was in Berlin. This year we're offering two, one in Chile and one in Italy. Uh, but those are uh, three residencies. They are very intense. Our intent is to make sure that they leave exhausted and happy. So um, it is a mixture of all kinds of action-based learning kind of things, uh, plus it um, uh, social events as well for students to meet each other in, in person and also to uh, uh, meet other students at Ross or around the university. So uh, very intensive uh, types of residencies. You have to complete three before you leave. Um, we are not, we, we do not have specific OMBA concentrations at this time. We are in fact a general management degree. We may do that as we sort of uh, survey student interests and we are learning a lot of things as we launch this program. And also students are able, if location and schedule permits, you can uh, take all of your electives on campus. So um, you do need to take the, 20, the 24 credits of core courses in the fundamental areas of business with the, your online classmates um, and in the online format. But um, if you'd like, you can come to campus, take electives with full-time students, weekend students, um, and uh, and you can take a mixture. If you want to take online electives plus a mixture of in-person electives, you can do that too. 
And did I get it all, John? I think I, I got that, it. That's a great option. That really is being able to take your electives with other students on campus if you have the time and, and, and can actually yes. take advantage of that opportunity. Now, Prashant, you're, you're probably still designing um, all the basics of your program since it's yet to launch, but I imagine that you have an overall structure uh, that, that can speak to the question of core versus electives, concentrations, and async versus sync. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I can answer um, all the questions that you asked. Uh, so we have completed all of that part of our design. And if, if I may go back to your earlier question about the length of the program. So we made some changes in our Flex MBA program, the uh, on-campus version, so that students can complete that program in now two years, and they have a total of uh, five years to complete it in. And so that would be the length for the Flex Online students as well. The soonest they can do it is in 24 months. Um, the longest would be 60 months. Uh, we expect most of our Flex Online students to complete it in about 33 to 36 months, like is typical for our Flex in-person students. Um, in terms of synchronous, asynchronous, you know, our uh, design team, uh, and our faculty, uh, you know, we had long discussions and, and debates about that. And in the end, we have landed on what we are calling a 50-50 design. So 50% of the content will be delivered asynchronously and 50% of the content of a course will be delivered synchronously in live sessions. And, and like Matt said, uh, students will have uh, their class sessions every week at the scheduled time in the evening. Uh, and you know we might adjust the time depending on uh, what time zone we want to make sure we are accommodating. So we, you know those uh, small details are are yet to be finalized. Uh, but uh, we will uh, they, so they will have regular classes every week live on Zoom. In addition, you know just like Michigan Ross, uh, our students will have three residencies on campus. So there'll be an opening residency where all the students will come to campus. That's where we will build a community. We will start off the opening residency with courses on leadership, team building, uh, communications, so that it's about the soft skills and, and we, we, we give them the soft skills to work uh, in dispersed teams uh, across the country uh, and, uh, and then go back and, and do their online courses. Um, the second residency on campus uh, will be at the beginning of the first of the second year. So it's sort of like, you know, you're starting a second year, let's refresh, let's all come back together, let's rebuild and, and strengthen our, our relationships and friendships. And then they go back to the second year. The third residency, which is uh, again, uh, for us required for all of our MBA students and is one of the highlights of the McDonough MBA uh, is our global residency. So all our students are required to go, go on a global residency and our Flex Online students will also be required to go on a global residency. That'll happen in late July. Uh, and you know, uh, we have over 26 countries where our students go in any, uh, you know, uh, across years. Uh, each year we offer the students about seven or eight choices of countries. And so whichever country they choose, they go there, spend the uh, uh, six to eight weeks on preparing for the visit, go there, meet the client, present some sort of a business solution that the client has in mind. Um, then in terms of core versus elective, uh, approximately a little less than 60% of our curriculum is core required content. Uh, and the other approx a little over 40% is electives. Uh, students can take electives uh, in the online format, but again, if they are able to uh, commute to campus, we would love to welcome them on the hilltop and come to the beautiful Georgetown campus and take classes in person. Uh, and those classes could be in the evening, could be on the weekend um, and, and those would be available to them, you know, as, uh, as we see, you know, demand play out. Um, finally, in terms of uh, concentrations and specializations, uh, again, you know, like Ross, we are a general management program. We don't have concentrations and specializations. However, what we do offer is the opportunity for students to uh, complete a series of courses, electives that lead to a certificate. Uh, and so right now we offer certificates in non-market strategies. So this is a certificate that uh, essentially exposes students to all of those influences I was talking about in terms of uh, policy, regulation, diplomacy, et cetera, and how those non-market forces influence business. 
A second certificate is uh, in um, a sustainable business. A third one is uh, business analytics. And a fourth one that we have just launched is in real estate. Um, and finally, students can, again, take a series of electives so that they can earn a STEM uh, eligible MBA degree uh, when they graduate from the program. Now, I, I want to you know, be a little cautious that all of this is available to our full-time and our flex in-person students. Uh, you know, it, again, you know, like Ross, uh, we will uh, evaluate what the demand for some of these is because we cannot offer all of these options to our flex online students from day one. Sure. But we are hopeful that over time, we will be able to offer all of these to those students as well. Terrific, a lot of flexibility there. Mary, what's, what's the breakdown at your school? All right. Well, let's see if I have this right. So async, that is actually easy. We are 100% asynchronous here at JWMI, and uh, and that's very intentional. However, what I will say is that we host live sessions all the time with our faculty. Uh, we host what we call success sessions uh, before assignments. And we have a lot of live in-person events with students. I was just at one in Canada a few weeks ago where students came from all over Canada and we had a great night and um, and we're partnered with them uh, and LinkedIn. Um, when it comes to the core and the pathway for students, our pathway here is very prescriptive. So it's a 12 course MBA. Uh, it's primarily a leadership, all things leadership MBA. And we're very prescriptive in the way that we designed it. As you know, Jack was an engineer. And so everything had to build off of each other. So when you come into the program, your first two courses are all about you. It's about leadership and executive presence. So you're really getting that ROI up front. We're building your confidence. We then get into subject matters like marketing and finance and accounting. And then at the end, it's more synthesis. We try to pull it all together so that when you leave your journey here with us, you have the opportunity to be in the C-suite and be in the C-suite position. And so our courses are built that way, which means we do not have uh, a lot of electives here because we, we've really been very intentional in saying this is what you need in order to be successful. We do have three concentrations here at JWMI. One is in healthcare. Uh, one is human resources, and the most recent is our operations management concentration. And all of those concentrations, we sat down and debated, just, just like my colleagues here, to say what makes the most sense, what's aligned with what we, you know, content we have on Jack, what's the demand um, in the marketplace, the ops management concentration we were building in the midst of the pandemic. And so what a time to build that concentration and talk about supply chain and logistics. And so very fortunate to have that. And our students, if they choose, many of them might take the leadership MBA and come back and get a grad cert in one of those concentrations if, if that's what they'd like to do. And um, I think, oh, time, core time. In terms of just what asynchronous looks like, uh, just to give a feel for folks that are wondering how does that work, it's about anywhere from 10 to 15 hours a week per course. And that can fluctuate depending on the assignments that you have that week and the depth of that assignment. So our assignments are things you would do in the workplace so that you could try and apply them and then come back and tell us about it. Uh, so for example, maybe it's if you're in HR, you might be writing a job description because that's what you're gonna do if you work in an HR department. So it just truly depends on the actual course, but it's anywhere from 10 to 15 hours a week. I think those were the four questions, John. Yeah, that's great. That's fantastic. And again, what I like is the appreciation for how different the programs are, different options for different kinds of people and what's best suited for you. I wonder if we might just talk a little bit about what you think differentiates your program from the rest. Now, some of this is going to be uh, overlap. Obviously, Mary, for you, it's going to be uh, basically you are teaching Jack Welch's gospel. Uh, that's got to be number one differentiation, right? Mm -hmm. um, but are, are there any other things that you think make your program stand out and away from the rest? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think our student, the way that we design the program is that a couple of things I think would differentiate us. One is our obsession over student feedback, which John, you kind of noted earlier. We really, our students feel a part of the curriculum, their voice uh, their feedback on what they both need and what they would change is very much considered in our design process anytime we change a course and in our faculty selection. Uh, one of our best assets is definitely our faculty and our faculty that we do not practice tenure here. So 
We're not a research-based university. We are all about uh, practical application. And so our faculty have been there and done that, meaning we have CEOs, we have VPs, we have directors who have all done the things that we're asking our students to do. And so they take a very consultative approach in the classroom. So for example, we've had students working for companies who have taken their marketing plans that they've developed in our marketing course and present it to their boss and have it come to life. Things like that is really key and core at what we do. And of course, you know, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't say the other differentiators, the curriculum, but other people study Jack, ours was built by Jack. And so having the opportunity to sit down with him and, you know, and work with some of the people that he worked with to say, okay, tell me, you know, using HR as an example, working with Bill Conate to say, tell me about the time you had to give Jack bad news. Give me a real world scenario that you both face that I can put in the classroom. That, you know, definitely students resonate with that. They see things that they see in their day to day. So when they are coming from work and into our classroom late at night or on a Sunday night, it feels more real to them and it feels more relevant to them so that they come back for more. Great. Thank you. And Prashant, what do you think is going to be the standout features of your program? Certainly uh, that international immersion at the end will, will definitely be a big standout thing. The fact that you're in Washington, D.C. and you do marry uh, public policy with business considerations the global nature of your school and your program is, is a core thing. I don't want to steal your thunder. I'm saying too much. I'm going to let you say what you think the standouts are. I, I actually want you to continue, John, because clearly we have done our marketing well. You know exactly what we stand for. So thank you for that endorsement. Uh, but you are exactly right. Uh, you know, we uh, we believe uh, we uh, uh, our, our educational experience rests on three key pillars. Uh, one is our presence in Washington, D.C. and everything it allows us to access that I've mentioned. Uh, the second is uh, our highly uh, interdisciplinary uh, culture within the university. So inviting faculty from the School of Foreign Studies, inviting faculty from the law school, from the policy school, and teaching business classes or uh, really helping our students to take classes in these other world-renowned colleges. Um, so, you know, the 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 and and all both of these are driven by the third pillar, which is uh, the the almost 250 year year history of Georgetown's Jesuit heritage, and a couple of things that really are important to think about the impact of the Jesuit values and heritage on education is the focus on what we call whole person education, and so part of whole person education is. Uh, that interdisciplinary is an integral part of whole person education. So we need to promote that in the classes we do in the business school, but also allowing students to hear from professors from other perspectives and in other colleges, hear from politicians and, and, and diplomats, and of course, from business people uh, you know, in terms of that. The other aspect of whole person education that you know, we are very keen on is the idea that education best happens if we are able to deliver three things in the student journey. The first is knowledge. You know, you need to learn some finance and accounting and, and operations and marketing and so on. There's some core knowledge that you obviously lack. That's why you came to the school. You need to make sure you learn that. The second is, you know, very much uh, along the lines of, of Mary uh, that she was describing is the application of that knowledge. So creating as much experiential learning opportunity as possible and a global immersion is sort of the highlight of that uh, immersion uh, in, uh, activity uh, that students have to engage in, in terms of consulting from a real company in, in somewhere in the world. Uh, the, the, uh, the third aspect of whole person education is creating opportunities for reflection. And we believe that you know, it is really important for students to take some time uh, and you know whether it is uh, through design of assessment in the pro in the courses, or it is uh, structured as co-curricular or extracurricular activities, that students need time for reflection. And it is through that reflection that they are actually able to learn their own lessons for what to do in the future. And so you know we've uh, COVID intervened, but you know we had been going to reflection retreats with our students, and we are going to restart those. Uh, you know we bring in lots of alumni to campus so that they can provide feedback and act as judges. And those act often as moments of reflection for our students that, oh, I didn't think of that, but you know, this person who has walked in these shoes 
actually is now helping me understand what I didn't uh, really think about or, or understand. So, you know, being more intentional about that reflection element in the overall education journey is a key part of, you know, what we do and what we believe makes our education a little unique. Great. And Patty, I know your number one differentiator, it's MAP. And for those of you who don't know what MAP is, it's multidisciplinary action projects. Michigan Ross has been a pioneer in experiential learning. Uh, it forms a core part of the full-time MBA curriculum. It's something that you've imported into your online experience. Tell us a little bit about that and what else you think differentiates the Ross online MBA. Sure. Uh, yes, uh, we. Uh, you are correct. We've been doing MAP for over 25 years. Um, it is something that we have a lot of experience in. The idea here is that once students learn mo most of their core coursework in the various areas of business, they then take those learnings and apply it to a real world situation in all of its messiness and ambiguity and basically taking it outside of the classroom, right? Um, our students break up into teams of four to six students and um, they work on uh, projects, real world projects. So they have to be, a, the, the company has to have skin in the game. Uh, they work on projects all over the world. And um, we have done a variety of different things. We do startups, we do, uh, brand corporate corporate names we do nonprofits so um again just like you said john lots of experience in this area um when we look at student satisfaction scores um one of the highest ranked things is in fact the map experience so um that is kind of one of the cornerstones of uh, of our ed uh, education here and our commitment i think to action based learning the idea that it's good to learn in the classroom but then it must be applied um, I think the other thing, too, is that, and this is what I always tell students um, at orientation, and, and in fact, in interviews with applicants, which is this is not a check the box MBA. Um, this, you know, when the faculty thought about doing an online MBA, the biggest thing that the faculty said was, is that this needs to be an MBA like any other Ross MBA. Uh, so again, as I said, it's not a check the box MBA. It is very rigorous. I do often have surprised students during that first term when they're taking their account financial accounting course say, wow, this is hard. It's like, yes, it is. And it's supposed to be. So um, as I said, our, our courses are designed by our senior faculty members, uh, thought leaders in, in their fields. And um, we pass that rigor, intellectual rigor on to the students. Again, they should be exhausted and happy once they get a Ross MBA. Exhausted and happy, there you go. <laughs> and, and, and Matt, I know that uh, UNC has doubled down on leadership and has a unique way to teach it. Is that uh, a differentiating aspect of your online MBA or not? Yeah, no, it, it really is. Leadership is kind of a, a foundational component for anybody in the business community. Um, with, here at MBA at UNC, you know, incorporating leadership into the curriculum is, is very important to us. Uh, and so students can do that a number of different ways. Um, we have that built into the curriculum itself um, through some of our core courses that the students do initially. Uh, everything from you know a basic 360 multi-rater um, to leadership development programs uh, to uh, you know courses that enable students to, to work with the career and leadership faculty. So we have career and leadership um, staff available to all of our students throughout the program, um, even after they graduate. Um, so it's a, it's a lifelong option that they can come back at any time and, and access this. Um, and basically we encourage students to develop their leadership skills throughout the program um, because it's, it's one thing to learn the skills in class, but it's another thing to take them to the job next day and apply them in, in, at, your, uh, at, your, at your job. So we encourage that um, throughout the program and we uh, provide the tools for students to do that uh, continuously throughout their lifetime. You know, I think the other strengths that we have in particular MBA at UNC are really our faculty and curriculum. Um, with our faculty, we are a research-based institution, um, but that means that our faculty are plugged into the Research Triangle Park area. That means we have connections all over the world uh, who are doing active research. And we pair those faculty with uh, clinical faculty, um, people who, you know, 
or C-suite individuals or active managers um, who come into the classroom and can give that, that application um, next to the theory. And uh, that combination has worked really well for us um, to kind of give students that holistic view uh, of, of business education. And then we really try to combine that with the flexibility in the program. Um, you know, we have our, our core uh, courses, then we have our elective portion. Uh, we have a variety of different in-person opportunities. Uh, we do international summits a couple times a year. Uh, we do uh, summits here in Chapel Hill so students can have a chance to come back and, and visit campus. Um, we have consulting experiences uh, and students can you know, ramp up or, or slow down depending on how their personal and professional lives are affected as well. Um, so all that together, I think, makes for a really great program for us. Yeah, I've attended uh, one of your weekend immersions in Silicon Valley where your students pitched to venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. So I can attest to those uh, very you know, rigorous in-person fun experiences that are part of the online uh, MBA at UNC. And I think that's very helpful for bonding and just you know, really getting close to faculty, frankly. Now, I want to ask each of you, um, because the online MBA market has really evolved. And, and in fact, since, you know, UNC launched, which you're the oldest program here, uh, having launched 11 years ago, and I remember the launch and having covered it myself. Um, obviously, it's become a market that's, um, I'd say, cluttered, a lot of competitors. Uh, most of the competitors are not as differentiated as, as you folks, uh, and they may not have the kind of reputation of brand that you, all of you are bringing to the market. Um, but I wonder over the next five to 10 years, how do you see this evolving? Not only for your own uh, online MBA product, um, but also the market in general. I mean, we recently did a story on the fact that there are now more online MBA students enrolled in programs in the US than full-time residential programs for the first time ever. Do you see this uh, continuing to grow and, and changing in what way, Matt? Yeah, no, I think it's an interesting time to be in online education. Um, we've certainly seen the growth and, and, and tracked it. Uh, and we are you know, actively following that as well. Um, being one of the, the first online MBA programs, this program was intentionally built from the ground up to be online. Uh, so all of our classes are built around an online pedagogy. So we try to tackle the curriculum in a way that's uh, easy for students to understand um, in a way for students to get feedback uh, through an online online model. Um, so I think, you know, moving through this transition of more schools coming online, uh, it's been very interesting with students with programs coming online uh, after the pandemic. Some schools had to transition um, directly after, during the pandemic. Um, and we've Thankfully, been doing this for a while for us. So for us, it was, uh, you know, kind of business as usual, which was great. Um, but just focusing more on some of the opportunities available in uh, academic learning, uh, making sure that we are conveying the information as, as well as possible um, and giving the students the opportunity to connect with faculty and each other in an online space um, with some of the, I think, exciting new opportunities available out there in the technology market um, will be especially relevant over the next, you know, three to five years as we kind of investigate some of those uh, more robust learning solutions. Patty, you already signaled that one, one possible change in Michigan Ross would be the development of more electives and majors, uh, which could be coming down the line. What other uh, things do you see in the future for the Michigan Ross online MBA? Well, you know, I mean, I, I you know, you, you you said that it's an interesting time to be in online education. I, I think it's an interesting time to be in education uh, right now, as everybody sort of uh, questions the value of um, a, a, a the educational experience and sort of what type of educational experience they want, right? Um, and I think really kind of the 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 thing that we would want to hang our hats on would be two things. One is quality. And the second is, in fact, flexibility. And we all seem to be, have flexible programs. And I think that is a very good thing. I have um, women in the program who have, you know, taken a break there and, um, you know, raised children and now 
are coming back to school, uh, you know, and they are anywhere, right? They could be anywhere. They don't have to be in Ann Arbor. They don't have to be within driving distance of Ann Arbor. Um, I have women doing that. I have, uh, you know, we have doctors. We have, you know, people who are in the medical profession and now want a degree to sort of move into, uh, you know, hospital administration, sort of be CEOs of, of health companies or hospitals. We have people in the military, as I'm sure everybody here does as well. So again, I, I think that is really sort of the, the, the North Star, right, is to offer a quality education for people no matter where they will be, and also no matter their life circumstances. I think those are really kind of the two things that are trying to guide us. Yep. Amiri, how do you see this evolving over the next five to 10 years? And I might add, I recently had a chance to speak with Jack uh, Welch's widow, Susie, and do a story on a course that she developed, which I think would be ideal in your program. I agree with you. I just saw Susie at graduation and we were talking about it and I saw the article and I thought it was great. And, you know, Susie is uh, still contributes greatly to the program and uh, and always offers fantastic advice. And and yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Patty in the sense that the, the interesting thing for me in doing this for so long is I remember there was a time where people would say, well, online school is, is that a real thing? And nobody's saying that anymore. Everyone is sort of jumping in the pool, if you will. And so what that looks like with more competition, I think ultimately will make all of us better. All boats rise in, in that sense. It's challenging us to rethink the product, the delivery of the product. And as we think about how we're going to evolve, I think it's one thing to look at concentrations and what the demand of the market is. Uh, it's also another thing to redefine what flexibility looks like, uh, what really matters to students, what does a return on the investment look like for our students. So you know, do we need to do think, rethink content in terms of delivery, smaller, you know, short content? How much are you doing from your phone? What is, how do we define immediately actionable ideas that we give to students that they can go into work tomorrow? And, and how do you take things like quiet quitting in the marketplace and put that into your classroom now uh, and have those conversations? Because you have the benefit of doing that a lot easier in some cases when you're teaching on the ground. I can just bring in my newspaper and talk to you about it. How do we do that? How do we bring that experience and still continue to challenge ourselves to, you know, the, the S curve, you got to continuously improve, right? If you're at the top of that curve, you need another one. And so I think uh, having more competition has been healthy that way. I, I think it will continue to make us better and deliver a better product. Um, and over time, I think even more schools will offer more options of both the online um, hybrid and ground delivery of courses. And for us right now, we're holding on to our three concentrations. We have a couple that more that we're researching to see if it makes sense, but we want to be really great at the three that we have. And we want to see the success of our students. At the end of the day, Jack always said he wasn't the brand. The success of our students is the brand. And so and we're going to see how we do with those, see their success stories and make sure we're doing everything right there and then look at the possibility of maybe some additional concentrations. Great. Well, Prashant, your, your online MBA is about to launch, but it isn't out there. So maybe the more appropriate question for you is how you see the overall market evolving over the next five to 10 years. You know, people talk about first mover advantage, but there's a big advantage in seeing what others have done and building from that, which is what you're doing. But how, how do you see this whole market playing out? Are you gonna, do you think that your online MBA will ultimately have a larger enrollment than your full-time MBA program? Quite possible, quite possible. I mean, right now we are uh, asking the question, will our online Flex MBA be larger than our in-person Flex MBA? Yes. And right. the, uh, you know, a softening of the in-person Flex MBA market. So we wouldn't be surprised if, in a year or two or three, uh, the online element of the Flex MBA is larger than the in-person element. Uh, you know, we have a reasonably good sized um, full-time MBA program, you know, uh, uh, almost the same size as, as UNC and, and a little smaller than uh, than Ross. You know, so we, we see the full-time, you know, uh, remaining the largest uh, in our portfolio um, amongst these options. But I think, you know, I'll make three observations. The first is that, I get the sense by looking at business schools, um, especially among the top you know, 30 or 50 schools, that we are all following a portfolio strategy. 
you know, 100 years ago, we all started with a full-time MBA and that was the only product on the market. Slowly that has, you know, started to expand and we've added more products in, in, our, uh, in, in our quiver of arrows. And now suddenly in the last decade, there's been a sudden mushrooming of whole host of graduate business options that schools are now offering. Sure. And so we are all sort of trying to see what portfolio, what combination of products that we offer best fit our unique strengths and our unique differentiation. So for example, we are offering a master of uh, arts in international business and diplomacy, because we believe that's something that fits our strengths. So you know, we, are not, we may or may not offer a, a master of, of marketing because maybe that's something Kellogg should offer, uh, you know, but we are going to offer uh, these specialized master's courses that fit our strength. Part of that portfolio also, I think, is a reflection on, you know, the comments on ROI, which is that, you know, the other way to think about ROI is the cost of delivering graduate business education is probably reaching that tipping point where people are saying, this is too much and, and it's hard for me to justify this. Uh, and you know, uh, sometimes the economy will justify it, but on many occasions, the economy might not justify the huge investment in, in the MBA. So you know, how do we think about the costs? How do we amortize the learning over time so that the cost you know, cash flow changes? And so therefore schools think more about lifelong learning rather than a two year or a three year degree uh, as the way right. for education to happen. Um, and, and the last thing I will say is, you know, I, I read a paper recently that, uh, and, and this was, you know, reports I had read other, otherwise as well, but this paper really, you know, uh, uh, hit it home that almost 50% of students in online business programs are within a 50 to 100 mile radius of that campus. Right. To me, the message was, it is really flexibility that people are asking. It's not like I'm, you know, 500 miles away from DC and therefore I cannot come to Georgetown, but I'm 50 miles from DC and still I cannot come to Georgetown because my life is so complicated. And so, you know, flexibility is absolutely paramount and it will be paramount, not just in the online uh, MBA, but across all our business education programs. Very, very good point. Because that's always been a quandary for me, why uh, more people aren't going to to the great brands uh, in the business community and, um, and not going to their regional or local institutions. But the truth is uh, people are rooted in those communities and those employers in that area are filled with alumni from those local universities, which keeps people within that 50, 100 mile radius, even in an online MBA program, which is one of the big surprises. So, hey, it's been great fun. I wish we had a lot more time um because we I, I could be on here for a couple of more hours with you guys um and i'm learning a lot too and i really enjoyed it so uh, mary prashant patty and matt thank you so much for participating and making this such a terrific panel and for all of you out there i hope you enjoyed this uh if you want to know more about these programs go to their websites they have excellent websites and great detail on every aspect of the programs uh, including the price tag, <laughs> which of course is an important element of all this. And, um, and again, you, uh, all you can see how accessible um, these folks are. You can reach out to them as well if you have additional questions. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this. And uh, this is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Thanks for watching. <laughs>